All right, so um, hello everybody in the audience, uh, in in the world, everyone who is listening, everyone who's not listening. Um, unfortunately, Janaya is off this week. Uh, Janaya had to go on some trip or something. Um, so instead, we have a special guest, um, the real Vriska Circuit. Hello. Uh, in the studio that we all share today. Uh, now, Vriska. <clears throat> I hear things are moving and shaking in your life. Uh, I hear you recently converted to uh, Catholicism. Yes, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of the fact that I could just talk to someone and all of my sins would be forgiven. That is how Catholicism works. Uh, I'm not a Catholicism <laughs> expert, but, you know, uh, the Lord is the way and the light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, while we have you, Vriska, I know you have to, you have to run oh, sorry, pretty quickly. Me. Um, but let's, let's all just go ahead and ask Vriska a question, uh, starting with Bucky. This, this is the many things you could, yes. you could ask Vriska circuit. Um, what's, uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Vriska is only going to be here for a little while. <laughs> what's your favorite treasure you've ever found, Vriska? I think that my favorite treasure is the diary of my ancestor. After all, it was so foundational to my whole existence. I feel it's important to have a positive role model in the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't call your spider mom your positive role model? I prefer not to talk about her. That's fair. What's your question, Momo? Um, so so Catholicism. I I've I've had a religious question <laughs> um, that I was hoping you could you could help me with personally. So yeah. So, um, Vriska Circuit, when Jesus died on the cross for, for people's sins, was that cringe <laughs> in your estimation? Who the fuck is Jesus? <laughs> no, you're right. I, that, good point. Well, he's Never the mind. founder of Catholicism, right? Yeah, Jesus Catholicism. That's, that's his last name. <laughs> I feel like I might have to reread some things. Possibly. Well, we we can uh, we'll, we'll get you we'll get you a Bible on your way out of here. Um, we have a Bible. Yeah. Is that responsible? <laughs> <laughs> That's true, Vriska. I think you'll like some of the stories in there. There's there's a lot of like stonings. There's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of uh, girl bosses in the Bible. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of exciting stuff that happens. Um, but yeah, that, that, that'll be cool for you. Um, Daft, what, what's your what what, do, what what would you like to ask Vriska Circuit? Uh, yes, Vriska, do you think Mind Fang had girl power? <laughs> I mean, obviously. After all, I modeled my entire life after her. Do you think she effectively utilized girl power by appropriating the movements of the su sufferer for her own personal gain and uh, <laughs> having supposed non-consensual relations with one of her slaves? No, you know what? This interview is over. I don't have to talk about any of this anymore. I'm I'm done. I'm leaving. Oh, I, this is, interview, is that Janaya in the closet? Oh 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 god. Okay. <laughs> oh well, my god, Janaya's been tied up this whole time. Oh god. Sure, I can't believe it. <laughs> yes, Briska broke into my house and tied me up for a minute. It it was the whole thing. That's okay. <laughs> we we got a nice chance to, to chat with her. Um I think we cleared the air. Um so yes. This, uh, for those of you listening, this is a podcast about rewriting Homestuck and apparently fucking around. Uh, last week we talked about, um, Act 5.2, which does feature Vriska Circuit. Uh, now we're going to continue that conversation by speaking about all of the characters. Uh, let's start with Vriska. Why not, why don't we start with Vriska? Here's a little recap of what she's done. She's been up to. <clears throat> Well, uh, in Act 5.1, she uh, made Tavros paralyzed. She yep. <laughs> did a bunch of horrible things that led to the creation of Beck Noir, who is the an an the enemy, the antagonist of, of the entire Act 5. Uh, and in this act, she starts to feel bad about killing Tavros and spills her guts to John about it. And we also get some insights into her ancestor diary. Now, the Ancestors are going to be a bonus episode, hopefully later on, if enough people want it. Hint, hint. Uh, post your comments about that. But 
we'll talk about how this her her ancestor Mind Fang's diary affected her because I think that's important even outside of uh, discussion about ancestors. Um, what do you guys make of Riska? We'll start uh, left from right this time. We'll start um, with Janaya. Okay, so like the the kind of consistent theme with all of the trolls and all of the characters that we've been coming back to for the rewrite is to um you know treat them with a little bit more nuance than canon homestuck did and like i know this is the part where we get you know sad briska feeling sour sort of um but like i i i would try to emphasize a couple of things a little bit more one of them would be uh, to start to plant the seeds of like genuine remorse uh, for for the shit that she's done, not just killing Tavros, but just in general, like not not like I don't think that we jump from Vriska as she is in the beginning of I've been to Vriska like you know I must repent. I think that you can start to show some subtle like oh shit maybe maybe killing all those people was was bad and I feel bad about it. So like I think that you can get. A little more subtlety in that conversation and like have her start to move towards um towards a point where she's starting to like i guess want to atone for some of the stuff she's done obviously there's a lot of nuance there and we can get into that later on but um the other thing that i would do is to uh, plant a few more seeds of like because we learn about mind fang in the diary we learn that you know, Vriska's basically like pattering her whole patterning her whole deal. I don't know what the fuck I was trying to say there. Um, off of Mind Fang, but I think it would be interesting to try to uh introduce a little bit more nuance of like that this is a thing that is bad for her explicitly. Like she should not be like Mind Fang. That is the worst thing that she can possibly do. And like to to try to illustrate that like this like kinning Mind Fang is something that hurts her rather than some like value neutral thing i think that this Kinning is like mind, thank god yeah yeah, yeah that, exactly that's what it is huh it's exactly what she's doing so I, I think that my my changes here my rewrite would be to have a lot more subtlety in the interactions with Vriska, where you're you're broadening the scope of like her feelings and making them a little less like oh i killed tavros and that's bad um I yeah. guess it reads like she just kind of <laughs> wants sympathy for that. Like right. She's I, I would like victimizing herself for. I would prefer paralyzed. to have a little more genuine, like something to empathize with. But you can clearly understand that she's still a long way from like fully realizing yeah. what she did. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Daft, what are your thoughts? Okay. Um, so we have. Vriska starting to become a little more conscious of her bad behavior, but it doesn't really come to a head until she's dead and she's just going through the bubbles. That is a conversation for another day. Um, there's this conversation where she basically like, before she kills Tavro, she's like, yeah, here's what I did. And then Tavros is all like, wow, um, I, I, I think that I am like going cringe. to have to stop you because that is super mega cringe, bro. And that Jack Nor guy <laughs> is going to kill all of us. Yeah. <laughs> and not only does Tavros think it's bad, but Terezi thinks it's bad too. Two people that she personally victimized have taken it up on their mantle to try and stop her when their actions have gone too far. Which really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, you hit on something interesting, which is the two people who she is probably closest to, Terezi and Davros, want her head by Act 2, especially Murderstuck, um, which is, you know, good in a narrative sense because it shows the failure of, of Riska's sort of uh, moral code. Um, yeah, I like that. I, I think that what would be interesting is if, like Janiah was saying, with those things, you could make her a little more sympathetic. Maybe in a rewrite, she did not make Beck Noir on purpose. She just wanted to sort of be the hero. And then her wanting to go and kill Beck Noir eventually is her misplaced, like, her trying to get redemption cheaply by killing Beck Noir. I don't know how much I agree with that, because one of the primary conceits of Riska's character is that she is this archetype of the Mary Sue 
um, which in history is a derogatory term for teenage girls who don't know how to write, who write characters, who whisk away the problems of the plot just by their mere existence. They are, um, and, and here's the thing, it's, it's not bad to have a Mary Sue character. Um, that's a very controversial statement for malintentioned people. But, but here's my point with that. It's okay to not know how to write, but for Andrew Hussey, it's not okay to create a caricature of um, a teenage girl's um, inability to write. So, so, what I, so what I want to propose with Vriska is that we make her explicitly an anti-hero. Get rid of all the uh, Mary Sue subtext. Just lean into um, all of this uh, bitterness and anger that she's feeling about being a Cerulean blood, you know, the quote unquote blue bud's burden. We're, we're just gonna, we're, we're, we've gotta ax the Mary Sue stuff. We gotta ax it all together. That's just not okay to continue doing if you're not gonna have any productive opinions upon that. We have Briska create uh, Beck Noor intentionally, not because she wanted to be the best or whatever, um, because I feel like a Briska without the context of the Neri Sue would replicate the Jack Noor thing. Because she um, understands, I think, what's going on with, with Homestuck. Um, she understands that, you know, time loops and that they have to be, that they're self-referential. She understands that she has to... Oh, you're making this really, really meta. Yeah. Like, I was going to tie it back well, to how... Well, Homestuck like, is. <laughs> well, I was going to tie it back to how Alternia is a very hard and brutal society, that genuine affection for hell sort of thing. Like, she unconsciously reproduces that because that's the society that she is from. And it's about getting her to learn that that's bad. Mm -hmm. But I think at this point in the story that the metaphor of like self self-sustaining you know your cycle forever um is there in how the trolls are mastering suburban mastering these time loops and the spirographs of time so i think riska what what she will say is like you know i've i've created Breknar because like i someone had to and now um i can go fight him and and she understands that cements her into the timeline and makes her important, which is, you know, and, and validates her existence, which she desperately needs. Uh, but the, the metaphor of that is like these spirographs of, of time and, and the system of, of narrative and entrenching yourself in that is the same way that she entrenched herself into Alternian society by her actions as a Cerulean blood. Wow. He could have done that. He really could have done that. That would have been so much right more there. clever than the original conceit. <laughs> uh -huh. I think I think this also plays into a lot of the seeds we're planting for uh, the concept of inevitability and how that's handled in the rewrite versus how it's handled in the original, and also for the eventual subversion of that, which I, you know, I, I in a rewrite I would make considerably more deliberate, um, both as far as like how the Lord English stuff is presented, and then also how uh, Game Over is handled um, to to deliberately subvert the concept of inevitability in that. You know, the characters, once they're aware of this system that they exist within, they can then work to subvert that system. I just keep thinking, you gave your characters a, a magic retcon item, and then inevitability is still a thing. Yeah, what was the point? Thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> fucked up. Uh, and then finally, Bucky, what are your thoughts on uh, Vriska? God. What are your Vriska opinions? We covered a lot of really good stuff. It's difficult to follow that. Um, I do like that. I like that she's a fucked up little little girl. Like every, again, every co character in Homestuck is a weird little kid, and I she I guess she will be older for this. But like the the core conceit of like weird kids, and sometimes the weird kids are bad. We've discussed how like Equius and Eridan also have their own badness going on. But Vriska's also like Vriska does fucked up shit and i think that's very girl boss of her um it's it would be it would be cool if like we got if we got to commit to that a bit i guess instead of like i don't know taking a, a sharp left off road in terms of how we're framing this yeah 
I agree. That's kind of what Friendsim did was the, like you said, the sharp turn away from, uh, I mean, Friendsim, she wasn't a girl boss. She was just, she was like a victim or yeah, Pester Quest. I'm sorry. Pester Quest, she was, uh, explicitly in the text, a victim of spider Mom, And I think that's true. Um, yeah, she's both a victim, but she's also a big perpetuator. Yeah, uh, as they say, no amount of victimization by anyone will make it okay for you to hurt other people. And I think that's sort of, I guess, Vriska's thesis. I realize she's very sad, but um, hundreds of, of other, you know, children are dead. They don't get to be in, sad. In, they don't get to be in anything. Real life, in real life, Vriska would be one of those girls who's, like, shitty in high school and then becomes a nurse. Uh. No, uh, Ar- Arania, for sure. Arania is absolutely... Oh, yeah, no, Arania. Yes. Oh, Arania yeah. is a nursing major 100,000%. Oh, and, my like, God. And, yeah. like, bigotedly gatekeeps resources and everything. Arania is the worst character. Like, not the worst yeah. character, but the, I think the most evil person in Homestuck, personally. I hundred percent agree. I uh, or I love to hate Arania. I, I feel the way about Arania that Crow feels about Cronus, where it's like <laughs> I, uh, there's a version of Arania that exists. You could fix head. her. I could make her worse. That is like yeah. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I've made I've made a better version of Arania <laughs> that's not such a, a shitty horrible person and has has intentionally turned away from that kind of behavior. But like in canon and what is possible with her, she is not a good person. <laughs> I like Arania. I like Arania a lot because she is the one character who uh, basically tells me that Homestuck is a lying piece of fucking garbage and has been the entire time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, Great you, character, does a lot of... Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Arania is mind fang. Like, I think a lot of people uh, tend to look that over whenever they're thinking about the yes. ancestors. Uh, Arania is a branch on that river. Like, there, there's... There's a path that became Mindfang, there's a path that became Arania, there are paths that become, like, better and worse people for various reasons, but the the initial conditions that can create Mindfang are there. So, like, she's an interesting character because it is possible to to take her in several different directions, and it, it's we almost get to see, we get to see glimpses of the person who turned away from that and then she just doesn't. She's just like, no, actually, I know what's she best goes for right, that, I'm going that to do this. stream goes right back into that river, and Homestar just uses her to extrapolate mm-hmm. on the character of Mindfang, because she does a slavery, and she does yep. a weird uh, sexual assault yeah. stuff. And yeah, exactly. She, she, well, she, the she, thing is, she does a slavery, but it's like, in the text, it's okay. It's just kind of like, oh, yeah, uh, you know, bad. we're going a whole army. Don't worry about it. Just, this is right. fine. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fucking... There's a lot with Arania. When we get to the dance ancestors, there's a reason. In more detail. There's a reason she gets fridged in meat. Yeah, uh, you you should always put your meat in the fridge. Uh, that's what I always say. Um, <laughs> let's let's uh, we we have spent. <laughs> I think I'm looking at the timer. We spent about one fifth of this episode on Vriska, which is sort of um, appropriate. It's what, it's what Vriska would have wanted. That that's yes, it's what Vriska exactly. Uh, I think in this episode we've or in this uh, act, rather, we've covered all we can. Um, Vriska mm-hmm. becomes interesting in Act 6, which is a contentious statement, but it, you know, is is true. It because is very that's true. where most of her her growth comes. And uh, we, uh, we talked about Terezi in some extent, so she doesn't really have much to do other than the things we've talked about in the last episode. So let's move on to um, kind of Car Cat. Because I think Carcat has a big role in this. This is his last big thing that he does. Because in Act Six, he's just a cream puff who gets pushed around by everybody. Um, <clears throat> but Carcat, this is Carcat's big moment. This is his leader moment. This is where he is the linchpin of uh, Murder Stuck. He is the one keeping everyone together, and he is the reason why the um, the the Murder Stuck um, train ends. Uh, so, yeah. He did such a good Car-cat. job that one time. No, he didn't. And that it, one time. It gave me false hope. He really didn't. Yeah. Like I say, he just... <laughs> right. Now he, we know he, he didn't. Straight but, like, off. at the time, it was like, finally, 
Um, but then Homestuck was like, no, if you saw him do anything good, uh, no, you didn't. No, Heart emoji. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sucks. We'll, we'll start with Bucky again. I, Bucky is the, uh, you, you like Car Cat, right? I have written an amount about Car Cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's a pretty good protag character. Uh, we're, and he does, he does kind of what he needs to do i I, again we've had notes about like some of the specific things that he says more in the in the realm of like yes we understand he's a shitty person but like the utility of proving he's a shitty person by him saying slurs is outweighed by the damage that is done by having him say slurs you can just i don't know i I think you could you could have it be such that like you could you could include a censored version of it maybe if you really want to get across that he was shitty but like really it's not there's other ways to, for him to be insulting that's more creative. He's older, he's a little bit more anxious about going off to the ordeals up until he like isn't and I think like he he might be more overtly wrestling with the fact that he didn't get to, or Ascension, the fact that he didn't get to, um, do the thing that he wanted to do, he didn't get to become a Thresh executioner. he didn't get to try, uh, he probably would have died, but he didn't get to try, and I think that's more, that was r- ripped out of his grasp much more, I guess, urgently. Because, like, he has a conversation with Mina, I think, later in Act 6 about this to some degree. But, like, I think he might be struggling or wrestling with that a little bit more in this iteration because of how old he is. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Aging him up makes him very different. Like we've said before, it would be interesting to have him be, like, in training to be a Thresh Executioner, etc. That is a huge part of his... You're shining a light on a part of his his character that is not shown a lot on because you know it's emphasized that he's a cream puff but uh like you say he is someone who wants to be a fucking thresh executioner and uh i think emphasizing that is important yeah i think the the cream puffiness was kind of a gradual flanderization that happened to carcat over the course of act six because people liked the guy but no, the guy wanted to go into the fucking military. I I have this I have this little yeah, fun story. Yeah, please forget that this person is a is a bootleg. Yeah, <laughs> I they really didn't want to talk about it, and they also didn't want to you know, understand this guy as as a threat because there's like this particular sort of way that uh, characters like him get understood in fandom. I mean, just look at like some of the tropes around like how Carcat is written in, in fan fiction, and um, so. <laughs> yeah and it it kind of sucks because i like this guy um the idea of an older car cat he would you know have kind of put that those genuine um feelings that he does is have about his, his friends a little bit um not so much on his on his sleeve he would we would see a car cat that's a bit more constrained uh and that could be really interesting because that would then make like when he finally does finally at the end of murder stuck like try and step up uh that would like show what his virtues really are and but this is the part of the story where where Carcat tells tells June, "I think I gave your universe cancer," um, and that that was such like a line for me in understanding Homestuck, because the way, because um, the the he's talking about the red miles, which he can see. We just don't know that they're going to be caused by um, Becknar yet, and they're red, mm. and that's like and they look like veins. Yeah, that's why he's having such a strong reaction. He still, like, has this deep, like, shame about his own body. Is Yeah, exactly. Like, he's just, like, he's still caught up on this um, so much. And kind of what I wanted to have start, like, unpacking now, because we've attached all these metaphors together of biology and um, generational trauma and, and the state into like this this one metaphor so kind of everything is biology the creation and destruction of universes is biology well then start using car Car cat to talk about the virtues of mutation and the virtues of change and like discrepancy and evolution and like you can you can use that to go well yes there are downsides and risks to stepping outside of what's what happened last time 
and it's not always good, but like part of the aspects of nature is not that it's this stagnant cycle, it's an evolving cycle, it's never the same twice. Yeah, my, I, I think just my only comment on Carcat, especially in this act, <clears throat> is unlike, I've said this before, unlike uh, June and Jane, who are the assigned protagonists of their respective arcs, Carcat is intentionally a leader. He wants to be a leader. That's his goal. And that's a lot different to even just young adult fiction in general, where almost every hero that you see in sort of these monomyth type uh, stories are heroes that are just kind of heroes because they were either chosen or because they were in the right circumstance. Karkat wants to put himself in that position. And like Momo said, it's important to consider mutation, especially given his ancestor, who was a revolutionary, uh, giving Karkat some more of those realizations in this act would would elevate his story, I think. Uh, Daph, what do you have to say? What do I have to say about Karkat? I don't have very many nice things to say about Karkat, that's for sure. You should <laughs> That's fair. Mm -hmm. Hurt his feelings. Drag him. Get him. Okay. Um, he does... Uh, this is probably a bit of a subjective thing, but as a... He's a 13-year-old. But you know what? I can criticize his response during an emergency situation. I don't think he does a very good job of keeping it together. That's probably a super mean thing to say. No, 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 no. He, I agree 100%. Like, he's just freaking out, and for the most part, he's entirely useless until, like, the moment of critical... Until the moment of critical action where he just shush pap scamsy. Um, yeah. That's... And I don't know if that's entirely fair to him, because he is a 13-year-old, but in an emergency situation, losing your shit and control of everyone and then just yelling at them in your uh, public memo that people from the past can read is perhaps not the greatest idea. I understand that you're going through a lot, buddy, but emergency situations take emotional responsibility that this character does not possess. Okay. Um, what else, what else, what else can I say about him? Um, so, uh, you have to keep in mind that I was someone who was reading Homestuck just because it was a replication of the evil that I had already had in my life up to this point. I was just kind of scrutinizing everything. So when this shush pap happened, I just kind of stared at it and went, hmm, I wonder how long it'll take for this to be fucked up. And then the next time you hear about Gamzee and Karkat, they broke it up. And I, and I just sat there. Yeah. The literal next time. Yeah. It's just a throwaway line. It's it's the worst. It was um it it you'll also notice that this is the moment where Homestuck really starts to fucking unravel because Carcat can't keep his Moiray allegiance with Gamzee. Like after that Moiray allegiance fails, everything just immediately falls to shit. Like, it's such an important relationship to understanding this comic just for how raw and visceral the message of that relationship is. And, and, and people wonder what went wrong with Homestuck. Well, you have, to, you have to realize that Andrew Hussey is a man that's very much trapped in his perspective and worldviews because of the way he was raised. And when a guy like that has to answer very hard and mean questions about subject matter that he quite frankly is not equipped to answer and cannot speak to everything just fucking <clears throat> falls apart because he gives you a false solution aka the retcon oh we'll get to the retcon that's that's on the horizon but yeah we but we won't be there so we gotta get our complaints in now there you go i might as well just say it i think the i think all of the retcons in homestuck have been bad but the retcon at the very very end was the moment that told me that he just didn't he is that this man was so sheltered was so ignorant of how real problems are that if you have to like completely rewrite sections of your entire comic just to fucking make this thing work and to give people a quote-unquote happy ending which by the way it wasn't happening 
that didn't happen because if you consider what post canon is and what its relationship is to Homestuck, the happy ending that everyone was quote unquote promised was a fucking lie, then um, the quality of Homestuck as a work comes into serious uh, question. Right. All this is Hussey trying to admit he doesn't have the answers, but doing it in the most abusive and like roundabout and fucked up way possible is totally deranged. I. <laughs> I feel yeah. bad for people who don't realize that. No, yeah, it, and this again, coming full circle, this is perfectly exemplified by Carcat because Hussey presents this very dramatic solution, which is uh, Carcat becoming Gamsey's mortar rail, which is, is, you know, fine. But then he doesn't commit to that uh, in any sort of capacity because he wants Gamsey to go back to being a scary man who lives in the pipes, and that sucks. It's not even clear what Carcat wants, but yeah, like it's it doesn't help. And Carcat, it's sort of implied Carcat was just paying like an uncomfortable amount of attention to Terezi, uh, instead of anything else going on. Like he ignores Rose's legitimate problems. I don't expect uh, that he would have been any less dismissive towards Gamzy was going through, especially because Gamzy was going through something that would have been very very scary for Carcat to consider, which is that like the game is fucking rigged. <laughs> Well, that, and he also yeah. was time-traveling to raise Calliope and Caliborn, a.k.a. the reason the kids exist. Uh, we never confirmed that there was there was that kind of, like, time travel for Gamsey to get there. Uh, well, they, Homestuck never bothered to tell us how Gamsey got to Earth. Well, the next time we do see Gamsey, he is with Aradia's time travel mechanism, so I can only assume that this had to be during the period just because of the that the that was that would have um, happened been to explain how Gamzy was present in the session um, of the Alpha Kids uh, before the meteor technically you're, you're arrived. You're making me, you're making but, me realize yeah. something, Momo. Uh -huh. um, Homestuck is a piece of work where the the trajectory in time and space of Lil Cal is explained better than like one of the main characters. Well, that's because, like, this guy just really <laughs> hates Fucking that people God. paid attention again. It's, yeah, like, uh, so Holmes, Holmes like, does this, these, re these three retcons, like Daph said, and every time it's the wrong solution. So why would it be the right solution in Act 6? Like, nothing's changed. There is also a real consideration on the table. It can also be that Gamzee really did God tier. I think that would be, um, I actually wanted to bring that up. I wrote that down in my notes. Um, having Gamzee be, like, uh, secretly God tier would be interesting, not just from a... I, I think Gams... What I'm saying is Gamsy has a lot of depth that isn't shown in the comic itself, but we can show with a rewrite that explicit depth, um, and having maybe, like, there's a mystery... There, there's a mystery to Gamsy in the comic where there's this talk of... Gamsy did, like, a secret super move on the Black King. He just, like, went crazy and did something weird, and that's just written off in the comic, and it's a very mysterious thing. But having Gamzee like go god tier, and everyone's like, "When when did he do that? Like what? Maybe there's something with his denizen. I don't know. There's there's something there." But what what I'm getting at is, Hussey just doesn't fucking do anything with this guy. He he thinks he's annoying. Like you can tell the author does not like this character, um, which sucks. And we got a little off track of Carcat. But I think Gamsey fits into that discussion nicely. Uh, finally, Janiah, what, what do you have to say about this? Oh, you don't want me to talk about Carcat, not because I have any particularly strong opinions uh, one way or the other, but I just don't... I, I, For the most part, I agree with what Momo was saying about like presenting his his role as a person and, and how he kind of like conceptualizes his existence and his role with, with re uh, relation to the group of people. Um, but I don't really have anything in that, that I could say uniquely that would add to that. Um, Carcat is one of the characters I just don't think much about. Oh, um, uh, that actually reminds me uh, before we move off of Carcat, I I'll tell you uh, really quickly. Um, the reason I uh, was able to piece together that Carcat had failed Gamzee was by the way he was talking about it. When, when he, the next time you hear Gam Carcat talking about his relationship with Gamzee, he's just all like, ah, oh, Gamzee was too difficult. He was too wrapped up in his religions. He's too hard to understand. And, and, that, and that 
but as someone who lives in an abusive household or used to and I escaped from it, that basically tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Uh, fuck. Because Gamzee is right. Like, correct. everything that Gamzee would have said in that position about um, the circumstances Gamzee is in, the religious circumstances Gamzee is in, is correct. Like, <laughs> Gamzee's not wrong about Lord English being real. Lord English having a power of the Alpha Timeline, and the Alpha Timeline necessitating certain behaviors and, and actions from people. Like, Gamzee's not wrong about any of that, but Car of course Carcat, like, would not have heard that. Like, there's no way that the car cat that we know would have accepted any of that information. I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I think the car cat discussion is pretty important uh, because car cat is the main guy. But on the other hand, he doesn't really do much. So um, in a rewrite situation, we could make him more important as well as, uh, I don't know. Some of these characters, I think, are fine but they're needed they they need more of and there's no character that is that especially moving on into act six than car cat yeah like i get that car cat is pathetic but i'm kind of sick of <laughs> i'm sick of that like i don't think that's an answer and i think that the story just wanted to let him vibe out in that and it's not good for him and he's miserable He's miserable at the end of Homestuck, and uh, try as you know people might pretend he's not miserable. He's miserable in uh, you know post canon completely. Uh, so we've talked about the trolls. We talked a lot about the trolls last time because of Murder Stuck. Uh, we're I'll leave some of the more detailed troll stuff till later, like um, Tavros's legs, uh, Solix's sort of awakening, um, because that is all detail stuff uh very interesting but i i do want to take a moment to talk about something we didn't talk about last time which is doc scratch specifically taking over the narrative we did talk about doc scratch but we left out the fact that he he does take over the narrative for a little while and my two cents about that is the meta stuff with the narrative in homestuck is all very interesting it's all very kind of quirky and gives a lot of personality to Homestuck, but I think it's kind of stupid. Like, having Andrew Hussey be a character in his own work, not a fan, especially when there's so many self-inserts already. And Doc Scratch is an example of that meta stuff that I, I, I tend to dislike. I think you can have him... Uh, th there, there, there should be another way to introduce him to the pl the character other than, like... Er, or the reader, rather, than having him just talk to the reader. That seems like a cop-out to me. So I, I have some thoughts on this um, from some of oh, the writing God. I've been doing recently. I was, I was hoping um, someone would. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have a podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah no. I, and, and the thing is, with, with Doc Scratch, like I, I, I mean, Andrew Hussey's not a character in the rewrite. We're, we're not <laughs> <kidding. No>. Um, <laughs> no. But, like, <laughs> I hope Doc Scratch, I think, because... Again, so we have established that there is still this concept of like the the narrative thread that Doc Scratch needs to have happen. That's this self-contained loop that has these inevitable circumstances. We've established that we're going to subvert that um, because the, the idea is that you're making an analogy to a system of control that you then subvert in order to, you know, create a better world. Um a genuinely better world and and uh, i think that it would be interesting to have a little bit of just a little bit of meta narrative with doc scratch where it brings up the concept that this is all this like his belief that this is an inevitable structure that can't be removed replaced or changed like just to basically tell the reader look you're what you're seeing here is the way things are the way things always were the way things always have to be um, you know, you know that this is a character that is, you know that it's a character that is evil or bad, um, is, is malintentioned, but not, he's not being deceptive from his perspective. Um, like I, I do, I do actually kind of like the, I never lie character, you know, that character trait where he, he doesn't lie, but he omits information and, and says things in the most deceptive yeah, way you he, possibly can. I, I do like lying. that because... Yeah, you never lie, you fucking white jackass. But you, you, you still trick people. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's the it's the traditional devil archetype where the the demon can't lie, but the demon can still trick you. Um, and I do like that. It's it's very fun. Um, but also, like, I think that this could could start to really prime the pump as far as what we're doing with the retcon and the idea of subverting this quote unquote inevitability of of the narrative. So I, I do think a little meta stuff with Doc Scratch is is, is good, but like losing a lot of the more like faffy like why is that a thing like the discs and everything is a, i mean i don't yeah i guess you could have it or not but i i don't really see it as being super important and then the stuff with i mean just no andrew hussey like this is this is the rewrite that andrew hussey didn't write so and and not going to do self-insert stuff with a with a with a writer we're just going to have doc scratch be the stand-in for this one version of the narrative that we will then subvert and part of the point is that the subverted version of the story is the one where they break free of that construct. So there isn't a replacement. There's no new Doc Scratch. The point is that it's all of the characters and their ability to live as people beyond the con the confines of the narrative. Yeah, there, there's a fic I wrote called Before Us. And there's a character in there named Professor Scratch who plays much the same role. And... I, when I was writing that, I ran up against the constraints of having your um, narrator be like, I, I just don't think that the, his takeover fits with what Homestuck is trying to do. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm caught on this because a lot of people love the meta shit in Homestuck. Uh, and I don't, but I can't argue that it doesn't add something to it. It adds a, a certain charm and... Uh, I don't know. I think having enough of it to really, I think having the parts of it that play into the message of the rewrite is good at least. And like anything on top of that is kind of gravy. I'm, I'm pretty neutral on the meta stuff. Like it can be a lot of fun. It can be really dumb as fuck. Um, I, I do like the concept of the sort of like, I like the concept of a hostile narrator that is, subverted i don't like the concept of a hostile narrator that is validated um that sucks and isn't fun but like i like the idea of this like kind of putting the point on like yeah this is a bad this is a bad take maybe we should like do something differently yeah um does anyone else have anything to talk about doc scratch i know i know uh i know he's a horrible person well Last episode, I went over how he basically has a little girl locked up in his closet. He's also he sure does. He's also responsible for like the the Lucy. He's also responsible for the enslavement of Alternia and Before Us. Um, he's all well, there's Lucy on Before Us. Uh, I think he's responsible for Pfeffery's Yeah, just, just Pfeffery's. Just glib glib. I think he installs that. He's not funny. No. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're correct. Well, he's not. I think he's better when he's written to not be funny, actually. I, I think Doc Scratch works better as a somewhat menacing. Oh, hold on a moment. Let me <laughs> clarify what I mean by he's not funny. It's not that I want a ha-ha, turtle funny, good time out of this man. I think just the idea of this man and everything he encompasses and um, and his actions in comic are so huge yikes that him just getting the treatment in Homestuck really isn't enough. I would have liked it if all of the kids just kicked his door down and beat the shit out of him until he was nothing but a pulp. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about the kids. We talked enough about these fucking yeah, gray bastards. Yeah, Fuck them. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we should talk about the kids because um, I, I wanted to tackle something specifically because this is where we said that, that June would become real. Ooh, I have some um, thoughts on this. Yes. Uh, I, I assume that <laughs> Janiah has, you know, pages and pages of documentation about June Egbert already. I will um, attempt to be brief. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, all I want to say to preface this is this is where June goes God tier, and this is where we said, uh, we, we, we said that originally we said 
you know, she would realize she's trans on the uh, three-year trip. However, I think that still fits with where we're going with it now, which is we're having her become trans when God-tearing and maybe coming to terms with that with Vriska and coinciding with those relationships. Um, I'll just let Janiah loose. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's talk about June. So um, I, I kind of like, I kind of talked about this uh, in some of the previous episodes where I sort of like laid out my kind of general thoughts on this, but like here's where we're kind of like bringing it all to a head, which is I think that throughout the rewrite, we are introducing bits and pieces of this is a trans woman who is questioning her shit. Like she's, you're starting in the very beginning with like bits and pieces of gender stuff. Um, you're, you're continuing to, uh, you know, bring that back through conversations that she has with the other characters, through comments that she has and get her to the point where she is like basically, um, and I, I don't know how I'd write the scene exactly, but to essentially have the scene where she is having this realization of, oh shit, I'm a woman and like gets to that point and is like, oh fuck right before she God tears. Um, so she's like, she is out. She has that, like that moment of awareness. And then when she God tears to have that, like, because we talked about doing the physical transformation thing, which I know is a pretty popular headcanon. But like, I, I would I would want to have that be at the end of her realizing that she's trans. Like, I, I would absolutely not want to do that first. That feels sort of gross to me. Like, it feels weird. Like, it's this, like, I don't know. You don't want to force some, someone's like, weird, gender. Like, force, force femme kind of bullshit fetish crap. Yeah, no, no, we're not doing <laughs> that. Assigned female like, bias is... uh, at... at... That's at ectobiologizing. <laughs> right. So this is something where she has realized a fact about herself and then that is validated by Sky. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, this is who you are. This is how you Yes. This is how you want to look. Um, and to have enough of that, like, even to have a scene like to have it like a conversation that's happening in parallel while she's going to do the god tier thing. Um, and then, you know, the the sort of realization of all that. And then you can use the time on the the meteor uh, or the spaceship to do like you can still have reflection and like other shit and and have her actually talk with Jade in like a meaningful way would be cool um, because like just realizing you're trans and coming out isn't the end of that process. Um, so like I think that that that's how I would do it. I I think I would use the god tier as this sort of like metaphor for making the decision or metaphor for doing physical transition once you've realized that that's a thing that you want to do. Um, I think that that would be, I don't know. I, I really like that idea. Um, I think that that is something that resonates with a lot of trans people. Um, and, and I think it would be a very effective way of, you know, kind of finishing the first part of this sort of like, you know, June Egbert gender, gender feelings, um, <laughs> gender know, reveal party, story. get killed on a quest. <laughs> gender <bed>. reveal party. <laughs> Which is like, you know, I and then and then there's all this other stuff that comes <laughs> oh, I know, just, on the tail of that. I just but. thought of something. Because <laughs> June that? goes God tier first, maybe Dave would be like, So does going God tier turn you into a girl? I don't know if I want that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. And, that would and be June a funny is like <laughs> You'd be a cute girl though. <laughs> um, but uh I don't know, I fucking I, I like the idea of Skya knowing not that you're Skya knows that you're trans. Um, fuck. I, I don't know. I love June. Yeah, June good. June good. You could Where use conversations with Jade to be like, you know, that that mm -hmm. there's other like Skya isn't what validated your trans as and other people can be trans with or without, you know, Skya's god tearing validation. Yeah. I think that would be important to say, but it is it is really cool yes. for for June because Skya is not like Skya. I don't know whether in this rewrite you're imagining it as like good or bad or neutral, but um, and I credit this again, like a, another point to riff here for for our talks about like what Skya is and what uh, suburb and scrub are. Uh, there's a reason they're called mythological roles. Like, Skya doesn't really care about who you are as a person, necessarily. Uh, it's more about what role are you going to serve in the mythology. 
of the planet that, you know, inherits your legacy. So, like, there's already these legends, like, uh, time is flat, remember? So, like, there's already these legends about these mythological, like, gods and, 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 and his, you know, these figures. Um, but then, like, the real life of the, of the people playing the game are just sort of getting slotted into one or another. And there's, I think there's room to talk about, like, that being fair or, or not fair or equitable or, or not equitable, depending on where you want to go uh... in a rewrite. Yeah, I, I we've talked about June before. I think that there is a lot of things we could say about June, uh, but this is the critical moment. This is the moment of trans. This is where we we take out our a big gun labeled transification beam that is in the blue, pink, and white colors, and we shoot it at June. Originally, I thought, all right, well, we have to treat this with uh, a lot of respect and a lot of sort of solemn uh decency and it's like i've come to realize over ruminating on it you you don't you just have to do it you know you you don't have to fucking uh surgically make every fucking character trans because i don't know we'll just make june fucking trans however we do it and uh that'll be better than whatever they came up with in the fucking uh post canon i.e. Yeah, nothing no, I, it's it's it, i think <clears throat> that it's kind of this like at the end of the day like you find a you find a version of that story you want to tell and you fucking tell it and you don't you don't get too you don't have to find a toblerone own like, justifying it or 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 whatever it's like this is a story and like the thing that the key thing is that the character has been given an actual arc of you know discovering this aspect of her identity and then having that validated and like you know if you uh, my most comment about sky is really interesting because like i see sky as being basically neutral it's 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 it, it has these mythological roles someone's got to do the job but like yeah the the heir of breath was a goddess you know that's just that's that's uh, you know because june is trans so like that's that validates her and and you know slots her into that role but that is you know that is who she is um and like i th i think that you know y you can try to be really like fucking you can get, try to get really meta about it or you can try to get really like you know over explainy and all that and it, it like you've presented a character who is going through a journey and this is a you know not the culmination of her journey but like a a high point of it a, a, a good midpoint and then there's i think it's important to have her talk to jade on that trip to you know, figure out what, what all of this means now that she's, you know, she's now uh, physically the way she wants to be and she realizes she's a woman, but it's like, okay, so, so what, what, what now? And that's so cool, <laughs> what do I do like, now? <laughs> their bond of sisters is so cool. Like, I, I love these two it is. as I sisters. Love, it's so good. It. And, like, but Jade mm -hmm. is, is failed so much by her yeah. mythological role and, like, that relationship. Yeah. And part of what I said about, like, you know, Jade helps Rose have her experiences be recognized then june helps jade have jade's experiences be recognized and then this validation um that kind of uh starts maybe in some facets of sky or because because daft mentioned last episode june is a privileged character how june can use that to you know validate other people and then it creates this cycle of validation that strengthens all the characters you know makes them a team and that would be so cool that would be cool. Also, it, it plays very well into what we were talking about last time with Jade being the kind of like the heart of all of them, where instead of being shuffled off, instead of being shuffled off to the side because her role in the fucking narrative is now fulfilled and fuck her, um, she has a role that extends beyond the concept of her narrative role where she is, she is the one that helps to tie them together as people, like not as like, our, our mythological roles within the game but as like what does it mean to be a to be a person under these like insane circumstances like to have these conversations with june about like you know so you're a woman what now and like to have conversations with rose about what rose is going through and then like to have them be supportive of jade and what she's going through um, and I get i guess she can talk and to dave is also and, here like, yeah, fucking dave, dave is a character um, but yeah, but to have this, like, I, I think the bond between June and Jade as sisters is a really, really cool concept that just, like, doesn't get explored. And I think, 
I like the idea of, of a jade that is like engaging in these conversations a lot more than a jade that's just miserable for three years. Like I don't I don't I actually that, love that. I fucking hate that. <laughs> oh, it, it doesn't it doesn't add what anything. A, it just what feels a shitty thing. It, it just feels like, you know, trauma porn at that point. Oh god. Uh we have moved into Jade a little bit. Uh I do have some things about Jade in this act. Uh so before that, do you do, um does anyone else other than myself, Momo and, and Janaya have anything to say about June or uh, thoughts about June as a as a trans woman? Just make her trans. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> the, <laughs> just make her trans. It's that easy. Like a like a like an infomercial. <laughs> Yesterday, you said tomorrow. Like uh, hi, I'm Troy McClure. A lot of people have asked me how to make a character trans. Well, the answer is simple. Just fucking do it. <laughs> don't don't fuck around with Toblerones. Don't hide any. Don't hide candy in a cave. You don't have to. That's not a necessary step. Right. Oh, Stop fuck. it. Just make yeah, them trans. Actually, there might. Be. That's really what happens. Don't try and have it both ways. I with do like, have oh, one no. time. Yeah. I do actually have something substantive to say about this. Didn't that Toblerone yep. thing happen before Homestuck Two? Mm-hmm. Oh well, th- um, there's no fucking excuse. Then. I. I there, there is no I have excuse. a video about it. I don't remember the details. There, it did happen before Homestuck 2, and I think possibly... I don't remember when it was in relation to the epilogues, but, like, there's a whole mess. There is there. no excuse Probably. for Andrew Hussey fumbling the ball that hard. No fucking excuse. There was some... In the old Pigeon Pod server, I actually... Someone brought it up, was, why isn't June canon yet? And someone said, well, HS2 is still going, so... Uh, and, and it was an official writer, I won't name them to out them, but they said something like, you don't want her to just look at the camera and say she's trans, do you? And it's like, sure. yes, I do want that. Sure. I would love that. Please. Please. Not every yeah, trans sure. person has to have some intricate fucking trans narrative. We have so few instances of when the character actually does that. That's not a trope yeah. that you're like bo- not playing trope. into. It's not cheap. <laughs> I just uh, one day yeah. I woke up and I was someone. Someone said to me, uh, "Hey, I don't think you're like uh, a cis person." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And it was that simple. Yeah, I I I front loaded all of my weird gender questioning and I didn't tell anyone about it. So like, I I did do some like very egg shit and like a lot of like gradual shifting but like essentially kind of got to a point where it's like oh fuck and like i i don't know i i liked the idea of uh, the potential for a character that had existed for a lot of her life presenting as a dude and then you know realize this thing and then like very quickly leans into it because that is what makes sense and makes you feel better about yourself and like I don't know. I know we're getting way off topic here, but like, and I know we've also established a June that has a a bit longer of a tale of like questioning and stuff, mainly to, I think it adds to her story, but like, but wait, fuck. <laughs> She's got a little like hoodie thing that counts. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that, I think that that is something that like you could do as well, although we're not, but like, yeah, in home sucks you, they could have just had June be like, oh shit i'm trans fuck and then like again kind of like what we're doing with the rewrite you can then take that realization like the realization that you're a trans woman is not the end of a journey it's the beginning of you having to live as a completely different person like what the fuck you you have to learn how to be a completely different person now and like it's it's not the it's not the end goal that's not how that works and it's weird that like I don't know. It's weird that it's treated like that in so many cases. Like, ah, you came out. Congratulations. End of end of story. Now, uh, step inside of this fridge, if you please. <laughs> yes, indeed. Ah, <laughs> uh, so, yes. Yeah. Anyway, I... with with that, let's um, talk about Jade because Jade is this is this is Jade's most. This is her at her most important and her only important. I'm so sorry, Jade, that they did you like this, but Jade in this part is. 
um, basically filling the leadership role in many ways, uh, in at least the frog breeding. And I think this is interesting because Kanaya and Jade have a conversation about, like, what the fuck the point of the game is. And Kanaya goes like, mm-hmm. oh, uh, this takes forever. You won't have time. And instead of being like, oh, that's disappointing, Jade just says, fuck you. I'm going to try anyway. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, oh, and, well, I'll get the time player to help then. And Kanaya's like, oh, yes, I and of that. And she makes Dave useful. For the first time, because <laughs> up till this point, Dave has been fucking around in the goddamn low hack stock exchange on some dumb errand Me? for Terezi, which I say dumb, it's very fun. However, uh, Jade in this act is incredibly charming, a lot of personality, the linchpin of Beck Noir's stuff. Uh, she makes, she completes the frog quest very quickly. She gets the little tadpole. Uh, she becomes god, do, uh, god tier, becomes a dog. I think this is all great. Let's just start. I don't care who starts. <laughs> I fucking love Jade. I think the conversation that she has with Kanaya is like the most beautiful conversation in all of Homestuck. There, there, I said it. There, 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 yeah, I there said go. it. My bias. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, I think she should, first of all, I think that she should get to talk to like Kanaya and Rose and June and all of them they should talk more they should talk about more things oh they should talk about lots of things oh um, fuck one of my favorite things is how jade is like um all you fucking trolls are talking to me out of order fuck you i'm putting a stop to that <laughs> <laughs> she's so good i like jade's energy in this act the problem is that jade gets that all taken away from her for no yes goddamn reason and like i I think that I think that it would be useful in the rewrite to add like keep all of that energy. It's great. Add some like add some more depth to her conversations with the other characters where there's more like, you know, establishing things for the future. There's a little more like relationship building stuff um, with with all of the characters and like, you know, making sure you firmly establish who she is as a character so that that doesn't get taken away from her because like. She deserves to continue to be important. And I think, like I was saying before, that it's important to establish that she is, she's important not because she has an important role to play in the narrative, although she does, but she's important because she's going to play a role in subverting the narrative. Um, And that's how she's going to remain relevant to the story in a way that doesn't require this weird meta-narrative horseshit concept. And like, I, I don't know, she's, she's a great character. Um, I think that she should have a tail and 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 she should express with it. That would be adorable. That that's all the only other thing I have to add in this. <laughs> yeah. Who has who has Jade thoughts? Okay, I should go now. Um I uh, I I didn't mention this before, but I think sh- there's a very interesting parallel between Jade and Vriska because when Jade was showing up even before she showed up, there were I, I heard that there were people speculating that she was going to be a Mary Sue type. And this is the way that Andrew... Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to actually word this a bit differently because I don't want to do it at the expense of Jade. But apparently, the way Andrew Hussey wanted to communicate this sentiment was by making Jade super, super functional, quote-unquote that she had no problems, that she was the girl who who could just do everything. And I think he tried to rectify that in Act 6 to middling results. But, like, one of the... Yeah, his answer was, like, he was so concerned about making a Mary Sue that he was like, well, um, I guess I'll just make horrible things happen to her. Which is bad and kind of sexist. Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying, Daft? There's just a lot of Jade that that Andrew. I think a lot of Andrew Hussey's writing insecurities are really exemplified through Jade as a character, um, because she there were there there was also like a bunch of jokes and memes about how Jade got less than the rest of them, and I do agree with those because I do remember seeing Jade frequent less frequently than the other characters, and. It's just so sad that he looked at a functional, very... Like, Jade is ostensibly one of the most functional characters in Homestuck. She gets shit done if there's something... She gets Dave into the game 
and she doesn't even have a fucking copy of the game. Like, Rose complains to Dave about this. Rose goes up to Dave and says, Jade got me in the game. You were supposed to get me in the game, but Jade did, and she didn't have a fucking copy yet. That's how fucking good Jade is at what she does. Of course, nobody knows about Beck yet, or I forget, but Jade has a lot of tricks and advantages that she uses, and she's always helping her friends. She has always been the most consistently, like, on it. If there is a thing that needs to be done, she will get it, and it's just very narratively unsatisfying that Andrew Hussey looked at this character and said, you know, in order to make her interesting, I will just have a bunch of traumatic things happen to this character and nothing productive happens because of that. And you know, it's Boo, so I'm sad stuck. that- Boo. Yeah, and, and like, Carcat and Dave fight over her like she's a piece of meat and it is like one of the most disgusting things I've had to compartmentalize from Homestuck during her arts. They, I didn't mention this last episode and I really really wanted to but there was a conversation in Homestuck where, 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 um, where after Carcat draws the fucking shipping chart he's talking to Jade on a public forum and then Dave's all like ha 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 after all that romantic shit you're slobbering over Jade and this is Dave taking out his nondescript genitals in front of Carcat as a show of dominance in order to stake his claim in Jade it's just so obvious that these that these two shitty shitty boys treat her like this fucking object it's so disgusting and and for her to have that conversation with Kanaya, and Kanaya, this this is the only character that Jade has a conversation with that is pleasant. And Kanaya's all like, you know what, it's nice to get to speak to someone who understands. Like, that conversation is so, so meaningful for, for Jade and Kanaya both as characters because they both get to take a break from their problems and just speak to each other and validate each other's troubles and woes and they actually enjoy spending time with each other which is something that is sorely sorely lacking in Homestuck. Like the, the, the very notion of intimacy is toyed with in the conversation with Jade and Kanaya and that is what I am fucking living for. Okay, okay, I need to stop. Someone else go, someone else go. There's one scene that like everybody forgets but it's just kind of, uh, Jade explains this dream she had um, about the last frog she needs, uh, seeing it on the island, it just appears there on a lily pad, and then it disappears before. She, um, oh no, it doesn't disappear. That kills it like immediately when he sees it, and that's her telling us how she figured out how to find the last frog for um, for the frog breeding, and it's never explained where this frog came from. So maybe just take it out. Maybe just don't make it necessary. Yeah. Maybe just get rid of it. Because, like, that is, the imagery is really potent, and I feel really drawn to it as a scene, but unfortunately, like, no, Homestuck didn't know what to do with it. So um, if you can't, like, find something for it, it's probably got to go. It's a very pretty picture of a bunch of garbage. I don't know. I don't know. It's like, what does it mean? I know it means something. I can tell it means something. I know Andrew didn't know what it meant, and I don't know what it meant, and that bothers me, and I'm gonna figure it out one day, but I don't get it, and so I'm obsessed with it. So just take it out, and you won't, you won't torment people like me who need I it to like make to, sense. I like to think that it's Jade coming into her, like, role as not only the space player who finds the frogs, but finally embracing the whole witch of space thing, but, but that's just me. Well, yeah, but, like, how actually does the frog get there that she sees as a kid? I think that the explanation is Andrew Hussey. Right, he and ran out of room and he's kind of stopped caring about all this <laughs> bullshit because it's, it's stupid and it well, doesn't matter. Space and players, I know. Space players are always tied to the frog. That's, like, that's like symbolism that is hard written in. Yeah, like, no, the symbolism, I get it, but, like, how did it get there? You don't really need to explain that sort of thing if you're a good writer. He, we, we see it like being sendificated. So I think that's what you have to change. Like if you, if you give us something that's clearly supposed to be a hook, um, either, either de-hook it. So it's just a fish or you, you take it out. Yeah. One or the well, other. Homestuck is a work itself that works 
that that uses a lot of like symbolism and imagery sometimes to get a point across so may so like thinking about it sometimes a little too much um is probably not a great idea like if something doesn't well, I have make... a problem with the symbolism i think the frog's great i think the lily pad's great um yeah I just like don't yeah. think about it past that okay if andrew hussey's a bad writer sometimes bad writing can be excused with pretty pictures that's but it's a, like, but, our but it's, tip everyone but Holmes talk is about time puzzles and about loops and like the, the specific like the sendification says that someone sent this frog right yeah try not so, to think like, about it too much in fact i'm gonna fix I, it no. right now it's gamsy gamsy sent the frog there i fixed it sent we the could frog. do that but then he it's like the but frog. then what does that mean symbolically like they have to be married that's like that's what people like about homestuck that's what that's what's so exciting about this part of the story is that everything well, Gamzee comes together at one point was messaging jade about something and we don't ever see that conversation there there i fixed it i fixed that one gammy gamsy and jade conversation that uh, we i think see. that the fix in the rewrite is probably just not to write the scene yes yeah, this might not or it could if it, you it's like it it's like can i we were talking about can I last time it's like i would just not have the problem yeah we could just <laughs> you could just, can not just not have, have the, the problem. problem you could just elect to not have the problem that's sort of that's sort of the point but, it, but when I'm you're sorry. rewriting something yeah. you you can yeah do like i'm not i'm not saying i hate this scene i actually kind of really like it i'm just mm. like i i'm trying to figure it out because i think that's kind of what's what's there for yeah um, that's the heartbreaking thing about a rewrite is you have to yeah. Leave out exactly. some things you enjoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bucky, what are your what are, what are your Jade thoughts? Well to the other things. Um, I think we should commit to her being a furry. There was like a back and forth joking that she super wasn't because it was cringe to be a furry, and then uh, she gets like ears, and we're giving her a tail, and like it's just sort of never. It's turned into a weird thing instead, and it could just be that she's just like, yep, I'm a furry, and that's cool, and then we just, like, say, and then, like, maybe you can make some lighthearted and kind furry jokes later, but you never make it weird, because why would you fucking do that? Right, don't make it weird. I don't like the tail. There's nothing wrong but, with furries. But that's, that's kind of on me. You guys can have it if you want. I just associate it with some very, like, malicious people in the fandom. That we're the pushing tail. for the tail oh, for very specific. bad reasons. So I've got I've got bad oh, associations for okay. it. I don't have those associations because I don't know what you're talking about. Nor do right. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. Jade is my Jade is, Jade is my scene. intellectual property. <laughs> the uh, the furry appearance I like because I think that the I, I, at this risk of sounding fucking pretentious, the furriness can be a metaphor. For how Jade is like, how she is in the story. Uh, furries are kind of like this very good-natured community who gets a bad rap because of all the weird porn that they make. But Jade is like it's misunderstood by a lot of people in the same way. You know what I mean? Does this make sense? I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Uh, I don't know. I think I think the metaphor is probably stretching a bit, but I do like I do like Jade being a furry. It could I be a metaphor yeah, for bisexual. Like all the characters are sort of pastiches sure. of different like internet personas, right? And so Jade yeah. being like the furry that like the weird girl that people think is kind of embarrassing or they're kind of suspicious of of her. They don't want to, you know. They, they wanted to be they're too cool but she's actually like one of the best people ever and like jade uh nepeta handshake meme yeah uh, oh yeah I that's like a good that. idea um I, I like i don't know i like jade as a character a lot the only other thing i would like to change about jade and june and this sort of wraps up both of these conversations is at the end of act 5.2 i think it's um so there is a and this will lead into the next point, which is, what's up with the meteor and the ship? Uh, because this is, th there's a thing that's set up in Act 5.2 of, you need to get out of the session, otherwise the scratch will erase you, which is worse than death because you will never have existed, uh, which is some actual stakes. Andrew Hussey is very deft here in acknowledging um, yes, death now is meaningless, so I have to make super death happen, which is fine. However, the way they escape this is in two different groups. One of the groups is basically just 
uh, June and Jade, and the other group is the Meteor crew, which is like every other fucking character. I I would so personally, um, did they have the ability to communicate with each other? I don't feel no, like they did. They didn't over the three years. No, it's specifically. I, I would add yeah, the ability them. for them to communicate with each other, and then just like keep they, it they, I guess the they could through the dream bubbles. Yeah, but that's because because mm. June meets Rose through, but it's not really. The communication in the traditional right, sense. Right, right. Like, I, I, I would make their ability to talk at least intermittently more more of a thing. Like, I don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be, like, constantly. Yeah, every time you stopped to, like, tell about a point in time over the three years, you could kind of convene that around a time they were able to exchange mm. letters through uh, the dream bubbles. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And, like, having having them have some communication and, like, so uh, I guess one having June and Jade like actually talk a lot is important. I think having characters on the media actually talk a lot is important. But then having the ability to like I kind of like the idea of like asynchronous communication. Like it's basically like sending you send someone a text or like a DM and you send like a bunch of thoughts and stuff and you're like yeah you know whenever you read this here's my thoughts on blah 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 and then the person reads it and they get to like think about a response and then they respond to you with a big you know a big paragraph and then you read it later so that they have something <laughs> kind of like that something. Wait, dave has that? dave is a time player so conceivably he could just this is totally fucking unrelated. I don't know why I thought of this, but Dave has literally all the time in the world to to like think of a response to people in real time, and yet he still talks like a fucking douchebag. <laughs> God. Anyway, I'm I mean, sorry. He's choosing to be like that. He's choosing to yes. be like that. That's the only conclusion <laughs> that I can come to. I don't like Dave very much. Continue. Um, I'm sorry. That's just no. You're good. I, uh, I'm basically like I I was rapping. Being himself. <laughs> his truest self um i i would Sorry. have the characters be able to communicate in like an asynchronous way where they can like they can kind of like talk to each other but not necessarily in real time and then they can kind of like you can use those conversations to to prompt further conversations between the characters so you could have like you know rose is like hey jade left me this message Kanaya, what do you think about this? Um, you know, stuff like that, where where they could talk about things that have that have happened, um, and and like basically have these like conversations that involve more than those couple people, but the other parties in it are you know somewhat distanced through through time or whatever. But like just to have more of a sense of like connection between the two groups, because like I think that there's a lot of I think there's a lot of missed opportunities for them to like develop their thoughts about each other in this big period of time and about themselves and all that, where you can come into the next portion of the comic very strong with, you know, having characters that have had a chance to grow a little bit as people. Mm -hmm. I, I would like, um, I was toying around with the idea of like having everyone end up on the meteor somehow. Um, I was toying with the idea because because I don't like the idea of Jade being isolated or the idea that she is isolated because there's still like Carapitians and Dave Sprite. But basically what I don't like about the three year time gap thing is they have nothing to do in that time, but they are still the focus characters in the intermissions in Act 6. And again, this we're, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. That is sort of the hallmark of this podcast, I guess. But what I'm saying is they should have a goal that they maybe have to find Jack Noir or they have to do something uh, during this three-year time gap. And we could talk more about that in the... What I um, think... Um, in the later on. ...would be cool is that their goal in this part of the story is to start sending, like, le like messages of advice however they can to the Alpha Kids. And maybe they're getting, like... They're getting blocked and like they're it's getting obscured so there's kind of like this mysterious input coming in from different directions yeah oh be, that makes sense because they do have to prepare the alpha kids they, they have to tell the alpha kids like uh you have to play this game but like don't worry that it's fucked up that's there's a reason for that don't worry here's what you have to do and then 
you know, maybe it gets blocked by, like, Beck Noir to keep him relevant yeah, or like maybe there, something maybe, else. Yeah, like, maybe, like, because um, there's still agents of Lord English who are, to be clear, being enslaved by him. That's not his fault. But, like, Damara and Curlos and people like that, you know, in the dream bubbles who could be working to to undermine this correspondence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, or only mm-hmm. let and select... And they are open to the dream yeah, bubble, so that would, that would matter. And only let, like, select things through to help kind of keep manipulate things within Lord English's alpha timeline because people aren't trying to work outside of that framework yet. Um, and that could be that could be really cool because it gives them something to do, but it also gives the characters room for the arcs that I think they sort of need to have. There is a little bit of a, de- a depressive, um, a low point for some characters here, and I think it works because like you can come back up at yes. the end, yeah. Especially Rose, yeah, yeah, uh, with her Rose. alcoholism. Yeah, um, I I think that I think the concept of having them trying to send messages back is really good, and it also again good. it like ties. That it ties into the idea of subverting the alpha timeline and breaking free of it because like they're trying to do that, but it's not working yet. Like they haven't quite figured it out mm-hmm. yet, but that's yeah, a good, they can start like probing at the seams of it. And then act, when yeah, they get they there, yeah, it's, you set the stage. They don't need to figure everything out right away. They shouldn't figure everything out right away. That's boring. You, you, you see them struggle and overcome obstacles and struggle and then succeed. Like you, you have the ebb and flow of, of narrative development and stakes where the characters are not just like shit on constantly. They get to, they get to have successes and setbacks and successes and whatnot. So Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be really cool. Yes. Uh, I, I, uh, like I said, that is, uh, act six. Um, the, the setup is, is now, but the act six is later. That's fine. We, We can go out of order. The final plot point that we did not discuss in the last episode is, uh, Rose and Dave's suicide quest, um, which is, to refresh the viewers, uh, the culmination of both of their arcs in this section, uh, because they're both dead. Uh, Dave gets killed by Beck Noir, and, well, they both get killed by Beck Noir in different circumstances. And so now they have one life left, and they have to, uh, Dave and Rose have to use their Durst life to um, push the moon of Durs out into space to explode the tumor and reset everything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think you guys remember this. I'm explaining it badly, but there it is. Uh, basically, it's a suicide quest, which later is revealed not to be a suicide quest because they get picked up uh, by the meteor, and also Arati and Solix are there. Well, they they don't know that the that the god tier there are god tier beds inside of Durson Prospect that can be used when you only have one. Yeah, they did they didn't know about that until they went down in there and it was like, oh shit. Yeah, and they find it and they they uh, go god tier near the green sun and that's all well and good. Uh, I don't have much to say about this myself. I like the idea of them thinking they're going to go on a suicide mission. I think this was handled pretty well. It's one of the more tense and dramatic. Uh, parts. Um, there's also some minor stuff with Dave Sprite. Dave Sprite in this part starts to not become a character anymore. He's like, sec- the, the, the story always tells us Dave Sprite is his own guy. He's not just a replacement Dave. And then the story treats him like a replacement Dave, which is stupid. Um, but yeah, the, uh, everything that happens to Dave Sprite in the story is like nightmarish to me. It makes me kind of upset. I don't like any of it. I'm sorry, people that really like Dave Petta Sprite. It's very Dave existentially Pet- horrible. Dave Petta Sprite is a fucking horrifying character. <laughs> like everything that character says and does is, is so scary. But like, yeah, yeah. So poor uh, Dave Sprite. Dave Deve- Petta Sprite or Dave Dave Petta Sprite or however it is pronounced. Um. I've never heard Devepita before, but I kind of like it. Gotta, gotta admit. I, I, I said like Devepita it. because that's how my brain read it. But, uh, yeah, Dave Sprite is not a real person. He, he's His his personhood is taken away by Homestuck, which I think is fucked up. Uh, because he uh, Homestuck, people meet themselves all the fucking time in Homestuck, and Dave Sprite is the first time we see that. And it's just kind of upsetting because he's just a clone of Dave who is a bird and they make some like bird jokes and they imply he has a cloaca, I believe. Yeah, I wish they, wish they didn't. 
Wish they didn't. I really wish um, they didn't. It's kind of like, this is where I think undermines some of the assertions that, oh, well, if you revive someone with a, with a sprite, it's like they're alive again. No, because cause Dave Sprite makes it pretty clear that being a sprite, like, comes with a lot of, like, changes to your psychology, because now you know, like, everything about the game, and now you're, yeah. And, like, it's not, it's not really the same. It's just coming right. back. You're a different person. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but back yeah. to, back to Dave and Rose. Um, Dave Sprite is interesting, but I don't really know what the fuck to do with him. Uh, do you want to um, just, um, I mean, this kind of sucks for him. It was like, I'm my own guy. And then when Dave God tears, like the reason that Dave doesn't subsume Dave Sprite is because this isn't, this isn't like a Sprite of one of the Daves from this timeline. It's a different timeline. It's Dave Sprite. But you could just say, you could just change the rules of like how it works and just get rid of Dave Sprite here when Dave God tears. I would be very on board with that, actually. And I think it would underscore some of the, like, you know, the weird shit around the sprites and the fact that he's not really yeah. that person. And then that would you know, that sucks, would consolidate a lot because also he would become a badass bird guy. Yeah, you cool. could give him wings if you wanted um, to. You, didn't, you yeah. don't have to, but you could. And maybe Dave has wings now. People would lose their yeah. shit. Like, totally, totally yeah. superfluous wings because yeah. they can fly anyway. But Exactly. Wings, he no. would complain like, about how stupid it <laughs> you is. Could have a, but they you could would have, yes. be cool looking. Dave, why do you flap your wings when you fly? You know we don't have to do that. And he's like, no, it looks cool. I gotta make it look cool. I'm so <laughs> fucking mad about yeah. those stupid wings and I could fly anyway. It's such a waste of bird. Um, yeah, or... Yeah, it, it could work like any god tearing. You become another version of yourself. That would mean that Dave would end up, uh, like Rose finds her quest bed. Maybe she doesn't get back in time to tell Dave, but Dave becomes Dave Sprite, and we're like, oh, cool. And then that would set things up to consolidate the the ship and the meteor because now it would be uh, Dave, Jade, and June on the ship. They could meet up at the Green Sun and then be like, wait a minute, I just fucking realized. Uh, Jade has a portal in herself to the Green Sun at all times, right? That is an established power of uh, First Guardians, which Jade is one. Um, It's arbitrarily said in Homestuck that she can't put herself through that portal, which to me has never made sense because why would you not be able to go through like the portal to your power source? That's fucking stupid. What, what, what is the point of having a portal for other people to your power source? Um, so why not just have Jade be like, Oh, they're at the green sun and then implodes everything to the green sun, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just a fucking golden ship crash into the meteor. She doesn't have to crash to have the super cool gold ship crash scene, which I like a lot. (laughs) I do like that, but I do also kind of like... I don't know whether I like that better or if I like the the, the asynchronous communication thing, but I think actually... Because then Rose would be the only human on the meteor in, right. in, in the Dave Sprite situation. No, 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 because... Um, oh. Well, are you talking about crashing the two together so you've got literally this like ship-meteor combination now? Okay, so... You'd still have the like the stuff with trying to communicate with the alpha. Oh, Dave so could just jump through think... Jade's portal. Like, no, no, I want to go hang out with Rose. I was just there. Like, I can't let her. I right. can't let her hang out with those stupid trolls by herself. I'm gonna bail. You stay with Jade here on the boat. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like I feel like you could kind of work it either way. I still, I do still kind of like the idea of keeping them separate, just because it allows you to like focus in more on certain like relationships between the characters more than others. And then like you still have the ability for them to talk to each other, just maybe not like directly yeah. face to face. So like, I think that, I think that some of these relationships do need some time to breathe and some space. So we don't have to decide now, uh, but I'm writing no, this down I for mean, later. That's, that's uh, this is good ideas. Um, I think it'll be easier to to when we decide like actually what to do in Act Six. Uh, however, these are good ideas, like alternate ways of that um, that situation being split up, and more goals in the, in in mind for them. Yes, yeah, so let, let us talk about Rose. How could I forget Rosalon? Uh, for the viewers in this part in Act Five Point Two, there are basically three like steps to her characterization. The first is she starts to tear shit up on her planet and discover that the game is a sham and rigged and bullshit and all that stuff. Uh, 
Two, she starts to talk to Doc Scratch, which leads her to become Grimdark and get killed by Jack Noir, which was, you know, Doc Scratch's trick all along. Um, and then third was the... Uh, because she needed to get killed in order to do the suicide mission to make the Green Sun, to make... to be able to birth Doc Scratch. Very confusing time loop shit, as usual. Thank you very much, Homestuck. Um... And then the third part is the actual suicide mission itself and rationalizing that with Dave and taking the tumor out into space and blowing shit up, etc. Uh, so we'll start from right to left because we st- we did left to right last time. Uh, Bucky, what do you have to say about Rose Lalonde in this Act 5.2? This is really where we see her like digging into... We get a lot of what... Not, not a lot, but like a, some of the idea of what light is and could be where she's like she's searching for knowledge and she's ripping apart for information and she's trying to find out how things tick because it's it's like she doesn't have enough time i think i think she knows by this point she's running on a deadline right or yes yeah uh yeah i think you're right Uh, so she knows she's running out of time and she needs to do things quickly it would make a it would maybe make a little bit more sense for an 18-year-old Rose to be interested in tearing the game apart, like, and kind of relate that back to the fact that, like, the w- world is gone, because she's not just teenage angsting anymore, because she's not 13. One of the things I'm trying to set up here is, like, one of the things about substance use besides, like, hereditary, uh like just besides it, it running in the family is like a situation or like 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 feeling like you need to co- compensate for something or deal with something or having a very big stressor in your life for example and i uh, the alcoholism that gets that uh rose deals with at least felt a little bit like a joke and it's hand waved off by Vriska later it's like it's always it's even with uh Rose's mom it's kind of always a joke and it does give it it does lend a lot of imagery to Void too but I think you could like you could maybe make it less of a joke and you could start building up to some of the reasons why that's happening here and like, Rose has these grandiose speeches about how she's... This is... We're building up to her going grim dark, and we're building up to her dealing with the, the like, emotional fallout of all of this later when she has to, like, sit still for three years. I don't know. I just want there to be a little bit more emotional punch to it. I'd like more focus on Rose's emotional state, really. You're, you're entirely right. I think the biggest thing you said was, uh, it is played as a joke, uh, the funny alcoholism because she slurs her words. It's the same thing as Roxy later on in that, that is a specific mirror that Homestuck tries to draw. And the only interesting thing that they do with it is like, look at these drunk women. Ha ha ho ho he he ha ha funny typo makes a Freudian slip. Uh, and having an actual conflict arise from that instead of just having it be solved when she kisses Kanaya uh, would be nice. So you're right. No, it, the, uh, the point was it didn't get solved when she kissed Kanai. Because Kanai, the, the next time we see him, yeah, yeah, Kanai yeah, yells yeah. at her, like, oh, you failure, I can't believe you You let everybody down. Which, like, thanks, Which is, Kanaya. As we know, the best way to get someone to stop doing an addictive behavior is when they uh, fall back into it, it's to call them a failure. Yeah, yeah. That is uh-huh. how you do that. That's sarcasm. Don't do that. <laughs> Kanai's like, I don't understand. I would just not do that. Yes. I mean, I, I in some ways, I do relate to Kanaya because I, I went to a casino once, and it was just not interesting to me. I, I won, like, $40 and then stopped playing blackjack. Um, so I, I do get that, like, mentality. And I think it's interesting to have um, a character with no answers to those problems try to reckon with uh, someone who has those problems. It's like, you know... I don't think and I would be a, an alcoholic. I think she would get drunk once and be like, uh, oh, that was fun, but, you know, I got I got seamstress things to do. Um, what are you saying, Janiah? 
Um, one comment. Can I as the character who who can get drunk and it doesn't become an addiction? Um, but like, I would say that actually that that's a conversation or series of conversations that I would actually really like to see. And I I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but like to have Rose be struggling with with alcoholism in a genuine way, like she's been through some horrific stuff. Um, she's seen things that are unfathomable to the human mind, and like relying on you know falling into alcohol as a way to try to cope with this is not like an unreasonable thing to potentially happen um but to have her trying to like communicate this to kanaya and kanaya having trouble understanding and then getting to a point where kanaya eventually does understand and they are able to communicate this and uh, uh i i would i would have that be the way that Rose deals with her alcoholism and not Vriska fixes it, but that's Vriska good. didn't oh, fix it. Vriska didn't oh, fix no. it. I know she didn't. I know she did. Oh, we'll 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 talk yeah, about the we'll, fucking. We'll get to that. The Vriska. Vriska oh Graham. my god. <laughs> Vriska Graham hurts my Vriska brain. Vriska Graham's a nightmare. Vriska Graham oh, is just like when you nightmare. know home suck is like fucking gone up its own ass, and there's just like no hope. <laughs> yes, it's so bad. Uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 I think that establishing their dynamic is important and having them be like, they genuinely care about each other, but have trouble communicating because like, in spite of like, everyone acts like Rose and Kanai are the same character and just like slightly different, but they're, they're not they're very, they're so different as people. They're, they're very different. They're very different characters. And I think that their relationship is more interesting if you acknowledge those differences and 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 play into them like for example uh can i as a character who deeply believes in suppressing her emotions like that's the way that you that's the way that you deal with things is you you are you just are okay this is why and you do the things this is why Um, having jade on the meteor would help kanaya because jade could be like that person or having her have the ability to yes to communicate even if it's not um, like one to one because um, Jay, and, and that, can, yeah, sorry, continue. I'm, I'm no, getting too you're excited. Good. So, well, I was going to say, so Rose is a character that 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 falls into her emotions very, very heavily. She just disguises it through twelve thousand layers of bullshit and sarcasm. She's <laughs> feeling <everything> maybe more <laughs> constantly. Um, and like, I, I think that having like even having the ability for Jay to like send a message that she sees and then like thinks about and talks with Kanaya about or something like that. Like having something that starts to like have the characters understand how to talk to each other more because like they are not similar. They, they have some similarities, but like they're not that similar as characters. And I think playing off those differences and and illustrating how it affects communication is more interesting than pretending that Rose and Kanaya are just kind of the same character whose only trait is being the only Wulua characters in Homestuck, which is not great. <laughs> yeah, da- Daft, you've you've spoken about um, how frustrating uh... it is to have uh, a shitty relationship being the only lesbian uh, portrayal. Do you have anything to add about Rose? I don't think Rosemary is a shitty relationship. I think the I think the execution of it and the way Andrew Hussey handled it is what made it shitty. Like Kanaya and Rose are definitely like a very interesting relationship, but all of that, but all of the interesting story, um, once again goes towards the whole thing that we were talking about with Jade earlier. Like instead of us getting like interesting character progression, we will then deal with. A bunch of traumatizing things happening to a character, um, in this case Kanaya, dealing with Rose's alcoholism and her being forced to, and being forced to contend with the problems that she had. Not saying that these two are the same characters, but Kanaya, um, in her role in Alternia, she was um, a Jade Blood, and a Jade Blood's role in Alternia was to. Be, was to live underground and basically help the mother grub produce babies. Now, the the traumatization that Kanaya went through in her role has made her this prim, queenly figure 
She wants everything proper. She wants everything in place. If something is wrong, then it, or, then it better be fixed within this second or she'll come over there and probably beat you to death with a ruler. And she can do it too, because she has probably seen people get beat to death with the ruler. Now, when she sees Rose completely fall out of society, I think it activates some primal panic in her. Like, she doesn't want Rose to fall out of society because she has been so thoroughly conditioned to replicate the violent society as much as possible. And the way Kanaya tries fixing it is to go up to Rose and just say, Hey, you fucking piece of shit failure, you absolute garbage woman. I fell in love with you and you failed me and you failed everyone so super hard and I don't like that you're doing this and if you don't fix everything up in a second then you're gonna have to deal with the extinction of the troll race. Do you like that about yourself you piece of shit godforsaken failure? Do you like that you fail people all the time? Are you sure I don't about fail that? people all the time. I am a very functional person. I get shit done at my direct expense as a person. Yeah, I get shit done. I do things all the time. And if you don't start doing the things, then everything is going to ravel apart at the scene. Meanwhile, like, Carcat and Terezi are in the background just, like, um, shaking in the corner. <laughs> like, their, their hair falling yes. out. Um. Yes. Like, ostensibly, Kanaya's solution to Rose's alcoholism is to reproduce the violent conditions of Alternia vocally at Rose. And of course, it doesn't fix anything. Oh, you're having a problem? Why not just, um, let's go underground and not talk to anyone at all. <laughs> yeah. Have you considered simply not having a problem anymore? <laughs> because other people yes. don't like it when you have one. So, therefore, like, because I, when I know it, I, so I don't. Have you considered mindfulness, Rose? <laughs> Have you tried yoga? <laughs> I've tried so much That's yoga. Bad. I've done so much yoga, Rose. You should do some. Rose. Rose. I believe the expression is live, laugh. laugh. <laughs> I love that. They are each other's manic pixie dream girl. Oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ro- the Ouroboros of manic pixie lesbians. Yeah. Actually, uh, what I think is going on here is that Kanaya basically has to come face front with the failings of society, and she just doesn't want to accept this. Like, in a way, like, even, even with Rose's relationship with Kanaya, I think what she was getting out of it was that someone was at least trying to hold her responsible for herself. I think Rose genuinely did appreciate that because no one else was really doing that. Uh, you could say that Jade was doing it, but we don't see conversations between Rose and Jade. No, the only conversations with Jade that we see are the ones with Dave and Carcat, and those are fucking horrible. Boom, boom, and, boom. and like, <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like R- Rose sees someone trying to take care of her. She looks at that and she says, ah, this must be what love is. I am yeah, not going to think pro- about this any problem. further. They Hussey positions them to be the solution to both of their problems, when yes. in reality, if you want a healthy relationship, you should probably, like, solve your problems internally instead of, like, foisting them on your significant other. And they can help you with that. Like, they can help you... But but the the help is, like, them finding you a therapist. <laughs> or, like... Not not being the therapist. Kanaya and Rose are always having this very quiet, very psychological game of 5D chess with each other all the fucking time because they don't like thinking about their problems and they don't want to take it out on each other, but they do it anyways. But they do it in such a convoluted method that that by the time of Rose's drinking problem, it's basically unsolvable. There is nowhere left to go from that. They are two 13-year-olds trapped there, and the only thing you can really do is get out of that, but they don't want to get out of that because they view each other as the fix to their each other's problems when that is 100% not the case. This is why I do want to write a Rosemary divorce fic. Sometimes it is okay to throw in the towel. You can come back to it. You can come back to Rose and Kanaya at any other time in their oh, lives. Oh, yeah, definitely. But the, time, but the time these two know each other... 
their relationship is complete fucking poison. It is. And the the critical thing, though, is it's poison, but the story and Hussey do not realize it is poison. They think that this yeah. is cute and cool. Everyone who was a Rosemary shipper went into it for what they saw in that relationship and not for what it actually was, which I think is the most tragic conceit of it. That's why we have post-canon and meat and candy. Meat and candy. That's almost like being honest about And it's the same thing I've said before. Like, these characters undeniably have chemistry. Like, it's there. And they're... Like, I'm not willing to throw that out um, j just to, like... Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to because really there's shouldn't. not enough the genuine like was... lesbian representation out there still. So, like, if I'm... A... Yeah, the, the problem, problem was, was Hussey. Hussey. It was always hussy. So I'm not I'm not throwing them out and I'm I'm not even I'm not even going to concede like that they're that they're poisoned fundamentally because I don't I don't think so. I just think that like unfortunately like Homes is too malicious. Homestuck is too malicious as a media property to have ever yes. delivered on them as anything. They could have had it all. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but they the really think this is... Don't you start. <laughs> yeah, the key I, I, thing, okay, the key full thing disclosure, thing. I was about to uh, recite the lyrics of Rolling in the Deep, but <laughs> luckily I forgot them, so you are spared this joke. Uh, stop writing Divorce Fever. Stop coping, people. Yeah. The key thing... The key thing to remember about Rose and Kanaya is that they don't ever give up on each other. And that is yeah. a very, very powerful uh, statement. I love Even them. if everything fell apart around them, <sighs> they never once considered yes. separating from each other as a real solution to their problems. And sometimes in a relationship, and sometimes when you deal with people, separating really isn't a real solution. Now, I know I just went on a big old tangent about how I want to write a divorce fic, but here's the thing about me writing a divorce fic. I want to write a divorce fic so I can make Rosemary, uh, so I can write my own little version of what would happen if Rosemary could transform into a healthy relationship. This does not mean that divorce is a solution that should be considered for all uh, lesbians in tumultuous relationship. And I do think that what Rose and Kanaya have is important. It's just that Homestuck was never equipped to give it to us. Fuck. Good stuff. Um, so, it, we are coming up on about 10 minutes left. So, I will use this time to say, does anyone have any last things about Act 5.2? Speak now forever, hold your peace. The only thing I'm going to say is very small, very sm sort of bite-sized, and that is... Uh, there's a part where June gets killed by Beck Noir, and then, uh, you know, due to God tier revives. Um, I like that. That's fine. It's a little out of step with how we later understand God tier to work, but that's, I don't care. Um, I think it would be more impactful, however, if God tiering was explained after that happened. To make it a little more impactful yeah. and make the first death of Homestuck be like, oh, this might actually have stakes, and then you explain yeah. it away. That's that's all. That's the only thing. I think that would be good. Have have June get killed, and it's like, holy shit, and then have June it get gets killed. Explained. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, they die lots of times, but you know what I mean. Where it's it's it is more of a more of a no shit moment. Yeah, that that I think would be uh, narratively pretty effective. Anyone else have anything? I just like some follow through on like the mayor's uh uh like quest for revolution because like or like some some more thematic exploration of what the hell's going on with leading an armed revolution and then later represent like coming to represent the light of democracy that seems not inconsistent, but, like, there's something more about the politics of Homestuck that's going on there, and we could, like, start... Because this is, this is where we get the, the armed revolution bit, so I'd like to... I'd like to stack... It's... There's... It's trying to say something about the rest of the plot of Homestuck, but it's not... 
as satisfying as it could be, I guess. So I would like to make sure that that gets worked into the rewritten plot, basically. Yes. I agree. I think uh, more Wayward Vagabond, more Mayor is always good. Mm. Uh, yeah, who who, um, who else? I, I think Daft was also had some ruminations. Oh, yeah. I said kill Dave Sprite. <laughs> kill Dave Sprite, yes. Um, actually, there is... I, I think I've probably mentioned this before in the past, but but I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Dave Cat for a second. Not because I like Dave Cat. Oh, yeah. But By all because... Means. This is where the seeds are grown of Dave Cat in this sort of end of uh, Act 5.2. There, There is Feel something free. very interesting about Car Cat and what he sees in Dave. Like, it's very clear that Car Cat sees Dave as an escape. Dave prevents a version... Dave presents... A version of society that Car Cat wants to fit into, but in order to fit into that society, he has to throw away the home that he came from, all of that culture, all of that history, and and for Dave to just blindly endorse Car Cat become a human or adjust to a human lifestyle, there is something deeply insidious and disgusting about that, and it never gets talked about in Homestuck. Even post-canon and the epilogues, they all want to present Dave Cat as this unabashedly good thing, when in reality something deeply eugenicist and horrific is being pushed with Dave Cat, and people really need to see that relationship for what it really is, which is this this awful, like, self-indulgent fucking Ouroboros of... You can't let knights cohabitate. They get like that. <laughs> Dave and Carcat, they just eat each other. They don't give... They do, and then they never help anyone ever again. They don't contribute. They they just... They just... Oh, God! Poor cat. They just both Sorry. fall into this fucking <laughs> hole, and they never come out. It's like a fucking Junji Ito story. Right, because everyone, like, because they're the cool guys, and, like, they're the guys that talk the most, and they're the most popular characters, everyone's already very satisfied with them, everyone's already woobified them to such extreme degree that they're just fine now, and they can just stay. But that's not alright, because, like, these characters have things they gotta, they gotta do, they have to get over. Carcat needs to unpack, like, his context and his culture, and, and you're right, like, Dave telling him, no, ignore that, like, it's not, it's not good. It's horrifying. The only thing that Carcat unpacks is other people's fucking yeah. problems. And he does it wrong. Lol. Yeah. I'm gonna do something I, I, I hope never to do again in my life, but I probably will. And I'm actually gonna say something nice about Homestuck. Um, Stop the presses. Hold I the know. phones. So, uh, we said, like, at the start of these two episodes that Act 5 is, like, and Act 5 Part 2 is really good, and the thing is, like, a lot of it is really good, and it is, it's, it is Homestuck at its best in so many ways, and, like, there's some things about it that I just want to, like, advocate for as, as they are, and that's all of the, the dialogueless flashes. I know that they're not, like, super... Um, super popular with everybody, but like they're the one thing that is so unique to Homestuck. Like this is something that was new and was so special, and so many things about it, like as the visual direction of it, the use of space and time, and the editing of Cascade is like I've never seen anything like it, and I probably never will again. Like from an animator's perspective, and like uh, someone trained in in film and like in video, this is legitimately like the miracle of Homestuck. And even if it wasn't a hundred, as like as successful as it possibly could have been in narrative or in other things, it's just it's so special. And that's the one thing about Homestuck I really cherish. Um, the the way the characters are so you know cartoonified and simplified, and they have very clear designs, makes the storytelling more effective than it would have been in these sorts of like flash animations because everyone's super symbolic, so you instantly recognize them when you see them, um, and it just works like so well um i i i i think it's it's insane to touch these they're they're so cool um that being said everything else is a trash fire but i mean <laughs> it's like, yeah it's this and like some of the meta stuff yeah i know that meta stuff isn't isn't for everybody and it can be really difficult to 
to understand or, or work with, but like you might just need to go to something that is not Homestuck to to get that. I, I was just gonna say real quick, I, I, I think you might have been away from the the call briefly when I, I was talking about the scratch meta stuff and I said I actually would keep at least scratch being like kind of meta because I think it helps to emphasize the the point we're making about like the inevitability of the narrative versus the concept of subverting it. Like, I think that that is actually, it is actually important to have at least some degree of a meta narrative framing device in order to do that effectively. Yes. My thought, uh, meta stuff, a lot of people, it, it is my opinion that meta stuff is value neutral at best, uh, and sort of fake deep at worst. I think that a lot of people say that Homestuck is meta as a compliment, and I don't really agree with that. I think the only... If, if you use meta to say something about stories or if you use meta to say something about narratives in general, uh, that's fine. But Homestuck's meta is like chowder-tier fourth wall breaks. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, ah, that was a... I, I'm not, I, 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 I like it. I think it's interesting. And I think it, it is like, it requires thought to understand. Uh, but I think that it really needs to be, like Momo said, it's good. And it needs to be injected with some kind of meaning for it to uh, mean anything. <laughs> I guess that's sort of a, a, a truism. It has to have meaning to mean anything. But a lot of the people... A lot of the people I see on fucking like you know Reddit or or uh, other or Twitter, they're all like, "Well, Homestuck is meta, ergo it's good." It's like, no, it's that's not true. Rick and Morty had a meta episode with a train that was the stupidest fucking shit I ever saw. That was dumb as hell. <laughs> yes, it, just because something requires thought to understand completely, like Inception, or the train episode, or Homestuck, doesn't mean it's good. If it has a meaning, like Inception, or like some parts of Homestuck then that's fine. But the the Rick and Morty episode was just them constructing a complicated story, which is like, okay, that's cool, and that's entertaining. Yeah, and entertaining. the guy would know that, that the Rick and Morty characters are existential about being in a show that's going to run for too many episodes. Like, I get it. You guys did that yes. episode five <laughs> episodes ago. Um, Rick and Morty is the specter that haunts this uh, podcast. Sorry. Every <laughs> time you guys Continue say something well. about Rick and Morty, I, I don't... I haven't watched Rick and Morty <laughs> You load another bullet into sorry, your gun Daphne. and you walk I, five steps I closer haven't to seen, my house. I haven't seen Rick and Morty since season one, so I'm like lost. And also, I hate all of you, that. and I will That's dox all of you, and I will find all of you. Yeah. <laughs> also, my my uh, my favorite my favorite ship in Homestuck <laughs> is Dave Cat, and I'm not being held against my will. Where are you? Where's, Where's the real Janaya? <laughs> Where'd she go? See, I forgot. You what I was were gonna, talking um, about Rick and Morty, you filthy Rick and Morty oh, stand. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Oh, Homestuck is a story about characters being as existential about being in a story, and like you could use that to like tell really cool things about what would a character feel realizing they're in a character written with like, you know, all these weird political, racial, psychosexual baggages that Homestuck has, yeah. and then like force it to kind of start unpacking itself. You could do that, yeah. Or you could just it go never like has the balls to say anything. no. It goes like, oh, narrative's fine. The end. What I like about yeah. what I like about uh, the ending of Homestuck, and what I hate about the epilogues the most, is that Homestuck at the end has the balls to say like, okay. All this predestination shit, it's over now due to the actions of these characters. Like, they killed Lord English. And it had the balls to say, we're not going to tell you some of these details. Like, where is Vriska? Who fucking knows? Uh, right. Terezi's probably going to be looking for her forever. And then the fucking epilogues <laughs> immediately say, no, uh, we have to explain what happened. And actually, yeah. uh, being in a story is the only thing that matters. Um, God, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> fucking you can Christ. leave things vague. God, that's, that's <laughs> yes. why there shouldn't be a She-Ra movie. Just leave it. You're, yeah, like, you're. It, it's the same thing as with world building. It's like you you need to get to a point where everything feels coherent and everything feels cohesive and you tell the story you want to tell and it's not so glaring that it's like, what the fuck is this? But like, it's possible to overdo it both in world building and in like explaining shit. It's like, you don't actually need to know 
every you know atom of the structure of the story you just need a good story like <laughs> sometimes ambiguity is good actually <laughs> Like, the ending of Problem Sleuth was really satisfying because it took everything that you had seen before and it kind of made it all relevant at the end in this kind of, like, beautiful chaos that, that was, like, it was like magic. It was like watching a magic trick, and that's really fun. And I think the ending of Homestuck, in its best case scenario, should still feel like that. And it's not to check all the boxes like it's a chore. It's to genuinely, like, be fun and playful and inventive with the things you've already put on the table. Um... And that's yeah, kind of I what agree. we're looking for. H Hussey is good at writing time loops and puzzles than he is writing stories. Right. And I think, like, the reason that the epilogues came back is that they realized that that wasn't the ending of Homestuck. And the ending of Homestuck was kind of kind of bad. And it wasn't just, oh, this is open-ended because like there's all, the, you know, the things you said. And they, they're kind of true, but they're also kind of excuses because all the characters are miserable. None of them actually think about any of their problems. Uh, honestly, and and all Hussey can do at the end is go, well, that's the point. And yeah, but if it really had been the point six years ago, you could have just left it there. You don't have to come back. You know you're coming back because something is wrong. So admit it. Right. You, yeah, it's like you, you, you can't have it. You can't have it both ways of it being both perfect and f completely flawed. Yeah, that's like, what I don't. hate about meat and candy. Like, it's, <laughs> in every single case, it's like trying to have it both ways. It's just like, mm -hmm. it, and it's just, it's it's emblematic of the problem and with what's wrong with neither, Homestuck. Yeah, and neither of them tell, a, they don't tell a compelling story individually. They don't tell a compelling story as a coherent whole. And then Homestuck 2 tried to fix the problems inherent to the epilogues and d did made it worse right because the epilogues are just somehow made it worse punishing you for <laughs> wanting to like wanting to get those answers and yeah you right. shouldn't need those answers at the end of the story but like also the story needs to understand itself and be honest about itself which homestuck yeah. cannot fucking do yeah the the epilogues were the monkey's paw curling and then punching you in the face it's like you know remove the stick from your own fucking i eye, like bitch. candy I'm tired of because you. i like it's always sunny in philadelphia and if i have to like candy because i like it's always sunny in philadelphia then there is a huge fucking problem with homestuck because homestuck is not it's always sunny in philadelphia i mean candy lacks the the Excuse yeah, but if you think about it in terms, that. it's like the closest comparison that I have because, like, the characters of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia are irredeemable shitheads who only spiral, spiral further into decay, and that's the fucking point. And, like... Mm -hmm. Right, I mean... But... Yeah, but that works for Always Sunny because it's like yeah, very and the problem with point. The problem, the problem, is problem with Candy is stuck is that it can't do that because yeah. it's not honest enough with itself to actually say what the problem is. Um, <clears throat> so that's it. Yeah. That's that's Act Five Point Two. Uh, this has been four episodes of Act Five, which is I, I thought foolishly I could get this done in one episode. <laughs> that is obviously not the case any longer. Uh, this is, yes, this is the, the final episode with, uh, Momo and Daft, um, for the foreseeable future. We'll probably have them back on for some other bonus episodes later, but next week we're going to tackle some stuff in Act 6. We're going to go back to three people. Uh, five people, everyone here is a wonderful guest, but five people is a lot to have on a podcast. I am um, subsumed into JoJo's back hole. Eight, eight <laughs> um, people. Eight guest Vriska yeah, episode. Yeah, we're going to have eight guests Please. on that Vriska <laughs> episode and not It edited. will be unedited raw yes. audio. It we're will just be screaming. Unlistenable. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's what but yeah, Vriska it, would have wanted. Um, I, I appreciate you guys talking about some of this stuff. I think we brought up a lot of things that, you know, me, and I, and Bucky alone would not have to, uh, talked about, like, especially with Gamzee. A lot of... Gamzee was someone I just wrote off before this project, and now... I am, like, convinced of Gamzee's truth. Um, <clears throat> I fucking love that guy. I actually went back and, like, read some of his uh, pester logs, um, like, last week. But uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, being here. And then also, of course, thank all the wonderful listeners. And Except for you, just... that one guy. 
he knows who he is. Except for if Andrew Hussey is listening, <laughs> <laughs> we we do not thank you. I'm just kidding. Uh, do no, better. They can yeah. listen. <laughs> fix fix this. It's, it's I'm Terezi. No, no, pointing. Hey, I don't Andrew Hussey. To to I'll oh, yeah, fucking just... find you and I'll shit on your goddamn lawn. I, I would just like yeah. Andrew Hussey to like be more self-reflective and oh. maybe stop trying to involve himself with things. <laughs> I, I, I do want to address, there was someone who said, um, without Andrew Hussey, there would be no Homestuck, so why do you constantly badmouth him? I want to answer that definitively. Uh, Andrew Hussey is not the fucking landlord of Homestuck. Like, we don't have to pay respect to him uh, if we're doing a rewrite of his project. Uh, and this also sort of answers the question of, why don't you just make something original uh, instead of rewriting Homestuck? I think every single one of us here has made something original, so please don't comment this. You you look like a fool. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, I I basically make nothing but original projects. Um, I only steeped my foot back into Homestuck for personal reasons. I mean, yeah, like we because we want to do this. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, God, um, the homesick wouldn't be here. Actually, without Andrew. Yeah, that's the problem. That's right. You do want to do this, and then I, I, I poke your back with, with a big, uh, comically large, um, uh-huh. pool cue revolver. <laughs> that you, 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 yeah. you know the one. Yeah. Actually, anyway. like half of the reason I'm still here is because of Act Eight. If Act Eight had not come out, I would have probably said fuck you to yeah. the Homestuck fandom and just never come back. Shout out to Act Eight. Whoever whoever made Act Eight is probably some kind of enormous brained sort of fucking idiot. No, no, I've heard um, I've heard they're a huge bitch. That <laughs> they hate Frisco. So. Oh, oh yeah, okay. that, well, that definitely. Uh, no. Compliment rescinded. <laughs> I'm uh I am gonna stop recording. So I don't Bye everybody. Rewriting Homestuck is a podcast by Jojo McLovin, Janiah Riley, and Bucky Grant, hosted and produced by me, Jojo. Please follow the links in the description to each collaborator's Twitter and subscribe on YouTube. I'd like to thank my patrons for this month, Pirate, Zipperosic, Kaleidoscope Mediator, Luna Skywalker Tucker, and Jojo. My Patreon can be found at patreon.com slash funkmclovin. Have a great day.